So maybe taking a step back, we talked about <laughs> the Nobel Prize for the Accelerating Universe, but uh, your work and the ideas uh, around supernova were important uh, in detecting this accelerating universe. Yeah. Can we go to the very basics of yeah. what is this uh, beautiful, mysterious object of a supernova? Right, so a, a supernova is an exploding star. Most stars die a relatively quiet death. Our, our own sun will, despite the fact that it'll become a, a red giant and incinerate Earth. It'll do that reasonably slowly. But there's a small minority of stars that end their lives in a titanic explosion. And that's not only exciting to watch from afar, but it's critical <laughs> to our existence because it is in these explosions that the heavy elements synthesize through nuclear reactions during the normal course of the star's evolution and during the explosion itself, get ejected into the cosmos, making them available mm -hmm. as raw material for new stars, planets, and ultimately life. You know, And that's just a great story, um, the best in, in some ways. So, you know, we like to study these things and, and our origins, but it turns out these are incredibly useful beacons as well, because if you know how powerful uh, an exploding star really is by measuring the apparent brightness at its peak in galaxies whose distances we already know through having made other measurements, mm -hmm. and you can thus calibrate how powerful the thing really is. And then you find ones that are much more distant. Then you can use their observed brightness compared with their true intrinsic power or luminosity to judge their distance and hence the distance of the galaxy in which they're located. So, okay, it's like looking at if you'll uh, let me just give this one analogy. Uh, you know, you judge the distance of an oncoming car at night by looking at how bright its headlights appear to be. And you've calibrated how bright the headlights are of a car that's two or three meters away of known distance. And you go, whoa, that's a, a faint headlight. And so that's pretty far away. You also use the apparent angular separation between the two headlights as a consistency check in your brain. But that's what your brain is doing. So we can do that for cars. We can do that for stars. <laughs> nice, I like that. But you know, with cars, the headlights are all there's some variation, there's, yeah. but but uh, they're somewhat similar, so you can make those kinds of conclusions. What, uh, how much uh, variation is there between supernova that you can, yeah, that in can you detect them? Right. So first of all, there are several different ways that stars can explode, and it depends on their mass and whether they're in a binary system and things like that. And the ones that we used for these cosmological purposes, studying the expansion of the history history of the universe are the so-called type Roman numeral one, lowercase a, type 1a supernovae. They come from a weird type of a star called a white dwarf. Our own sun will turn into a white dwarf in about 7 billion years. It'll have about half its present mass compressed into a volume just the size of Earth. So that's an inordinate density, wow. okay? It's incredibly dense. And the matter is what's called by quantum physicists degenerate matter, not because it's morally reprehensible or anything like that, but this is just the <laughs> no name judgments that, here. <laughs> yeah, quantum physicists give to electrons that are squeezed into a very tight space. The electrons take on a motion due to Heisenberg uncertain, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and also due to the Pauli exclusion principle that electrons don't like to be in the same place. They like to avoid each other. So those two things mean that a lot of electrons are moving very rapidly, which gives the star an extra pressure far above the thermal pressure associated with just the random motions of particles inside the star. So it's a weird type of star, but normally it wouldn't explode and our sun won't explode, except that if such a white dwarf is in a pair with another more or less normal star, it can steal material from that normal star until it gets to an unstable limit, roughly one and a half times the mass of our sun, 1.4 or so. This is known as the Chandrasekhar, Chandrasekhar limit after Subramanian Chandrasekhar, an Indian astrophysicist who figured this out when he was about 20 years old on a voyage from India to England where he was to be educated. And then he did this. And then 50 years later, he won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1984, largely for this work, okay, that he did as a youngster who was on his way to be educated, you know. Oh, and his advisor 
the great Arthur Eddington in England, who had done a lot of great things and was a great astrophysicist. Nevertheless, he too was human and had his faults. He ridiculed Chandra's scientific work at a conference in England. And, you know, most of us, if we had been Chandra, would have just given up astrophysics at that time, you know, when the great Arthur Eddington, you know, ridicules our our work. And that's another inspirational story for the youngster, you know, just just keep going, you know. But anyway, Ignore your John, advisors. <laughs> yeah, no matter what your advisor says, right? So, or don't always pay attention to your yeah. advisor, right? Don't don't be uh don't lose hope if you really think you're on to something. Yeah. That doesn't mean never listen to your advisor. They may have sage advice as well. Yeah. But anyway, um, you know, when a white dwarf grows to a certain mass, it becomes unstable, and one of the ways it can end its life is to go through a thermonuclear runaway. So basically, the carbon nuclei inside the white dwarf starts start fusing together to form heavier nuclei. And the energy that those fusion reactions emit uh, emits doesn't go into um, you know, being dissipated out of the star or, you know, whatever, uh, or expanding it the way, you know, if you take a blowtorch to the middle of the sun, you heat up its gases, the gases would expand and cool. But this degenerate star can't expand and cool. And so the energy pumped in through these fusion reactions goes into making the nuclei move faster. And that gets more of them sufficiently close together that they can undergo nuclear fusion, thereby releasing more energy that goes into speeding up more nuclei. And thus you have a, a runaway, a, mm -hmm. a bomb, a, an uncontrolled fusion nuclear bomb. fusion reactor, right? Instead yeah. of the controlled fusion, which is what our sun does, okay? Our sun is a marvelous controlled fusion reactor. This is what we need here on Earth, yeah. fusion energy to solve our energy crisis, right? Uh, but the sun holds the stuff in, you know, through gravity, and you need a big mass to do that. So this un uncontrolled fusion reaction blows up a star that's pretty much the same in all cases. Mm -hmm. And you measure it to be almost the same in all cases. But the devil is in the details. And in fact, we observe them to not be all the same. And theoretically, they might not be all the same because the rate of the fusion reactions might depend on the amount of trace heavier elements in the white dwarf. And that could depend on how old it is when it was, you know, whether it was born billions of years ago when there weren't many heavier elements or whether it's a relatively young white dwarf and all kinds of other things. And part of my work was to show that indeed not all the type 1As are the same. You have to be careful when you use them. You have to calibrate them. They're not standard candles the way it just if all headlights or all candles were the same lumens or whatever, you'd say they're standard, and then it would be standard relatively... candles is an yeah. awesome term. Okay, <laughs> standard candles is what astronomers like to say. All but the night sky. I don't like that term because there aren't any standard candles, but yeah. there are standardizable candles. And by looking at oh, these, you calibrate type 1A, them. That's what you yeah, mean. you calibratable, standardizable, calibratable. You yeah. look at enough of them in nearby galaxies whose distances you know independently, and what you can tell is that. You know, uh, and this is something that a colleague of mine, Mark Phillips, did, who was on Schmidt's team, and arguably one of the was one of the people who deserved the Nobel Prize. But he showed that the intrinsically more powerful Type One As uh, decline in brightness, and it turns out rise in brightness as well, mm -hmm. more slowly than the less luminous One As. And so, if you calibrate this by measuring a whole bunch of nearby ones, and then you look at a distant one. Instead of saying, well, it's a 100-watt Type 1A supernova, they're much more powerful than that, by the way, mm -hmm. plus or minus 50, you can say, no, it's it's 112 plus or minus 15, okay. or, it's, or it's 84 plus or minus 17. It, it tells you where it is in the power scale, and it greatly decreases the uncertainties. And that's what makes these things cosmologically useful. I showed that if you spread the light out into a spectrum, you can tell spectroscopically that these things mm -hmm. are different as well. And in 1991, I happened to study two of the extreme peculiar ones, the mm. low luminosity ones and the high luminosity ones, 1991BG and 1991T. This showed that not all the 1As are the same. And indeed, at the time of 1991, I was a little bit skeptical 
that we could use type 1As because of this diversity that I was observing. But in 1993, Mark Phillips wrote a paper that showed this correlation between the light curve, the brightness versus time, and the peak luminosity. And Which once gives you, you enough information that, to calibrate. Yeah, then they become calibratable, and that was a game changer. How many type 1As are out there to, oh, gosh, to use for data? Now there are thousands of them. But thousands, at the wow. time, the high z team had 16, and the um, Supernova Cosmology Project had 40, mm -hmm. but the 16 were better measured than the 40, and so our statistical uncertainties were comparable if you look at the two papers that were published. How does that make you uh, feel that there's these gigantic explosions just sprinkled out there? Is that Well, I certainly don't want one to be very nearby, and it would have to be within something like 10 light years to be an existential threat. So it, they can happen in our uh, galaxy? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, you know, so they we can would happen. be okay? Uh, uh, in most cases, we'd be okay, because our galaxy is 100,000 light years across, okay. and you'd need one of these things to be within about 10 light years to be an existential threat. And it gives birth to a, a bunch of other um, stars, I guess? Yeah, it gives birth to expanding gases that are chemically enriched, and those expanding gases mix with other chemically enriched expanding gases or primordial clouds of hydrogen and helium 